So in order to uh, remain uh, on track and on time, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time introducing our featured guest. Um, uh, suffice to say that if you uh, read anything about Mr. Andrew Yang, you will quickly find out that he is an impressive individual with a record of public service, um, entrepreneur, and has officially uh, thrown his hat uh, into a crowded field to, uh, for the Democratic nomination of uh, President of the United States. So I think he is nearby the stage. I have lost him in the crowd. <laughs> and here he is. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Gay. I've been uh, playing musical chairs with the water, but I think that is an is untouched. New water, my new old water. Thing? Yes, yeah. I think that is untouched. Um, can I just lead out with the Go first ahead. question? Yeah. You got it. Um, Simeon is our question guru no, um, no, no. and has uh, scripted some really good questions for us. Um, but this is a very basic question, a fundamental question that um, you know, most people want to know when they hear from the candidates. But why are you running for president of the United States? I'm running for president because I think we've been fundamentally dishonest about the reason why Donald Trump's a president. There, that's, that's not one reason, there are multiple reasons. But to me, the driving reason was that we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, and 40,000 right here in Iowa. And if you look at the voting district data, there's a straight line up between the adoption of industrial automation in a district and the movement towards Trump. And unfortunately, my friends in Silicon Valley believe, and I agree with them, that we're going to do the same thing to millions of retail workers, call center workers, fast food workers, truck drivers, and on and on through the economy. We're in the third inning of what they're calling the fourth industrial revolution. And Donald Trump is a symptom. He's not the disease. So I'm running for president to let people know it is not immigrants that are causing these economic concerns. We all know this, I believe. Uh, it's technology and the fact that our economy is evolving in a way that's pushing more and more people to the sidelines. So I'm running for president to let the American people know that that's the problem we need to solve, and then enacting meaningful solutions, including a dividend of $1,000 a month for everyone in America starting at age 18. Yeah! yeah. yeah. Uh, let's, okay, all right. Um, Andrew, can you, can you see all these little faces over here? <laughs> oh, I do see little faces. Hi, we're so happy you guys are here. There is just this crowd of young little children. Um, really excited to be here. Um, we will I, need to see your ID <laughs> and have an alcoholic beverage. Um, but I, my question is, what do you say to young people like these young folks right here who are looking at you with these eyes about um, deciding to run for office? What do you say to young folks who are kind of looking at you as inspiration? Well, right now I say grow up quick so you can vote. <laughs> Um, but the people in Iowa, I mean, this place is so politically supercharged. I feel like you all practice democracy at a much higher level, so I would have very little to, to add to the, the people here. It's really the people in the rest of the country that feel like their vote doesn't matter. And the, the nastiest part is they're largely correct. That our system has been overrun by corporate money, and people sense that. If I'm not a millionaire, and you know, it's like I don't live in a particular place. And the reason why I'm here and all the other candidates are here is that you all have an historic level of power. It does not feel like it all the time. You're just living your life, you're hanging out, every once in a while a presidential candidate comes through. But if the people of Iowa decide to get behind a vision of an economy, a trickle-up economy from people and families and communities up, we can take that vision to the rest of the country in 2020 and it'll spread like wildfire. And that's a power that only you have. And that's unique to Iowa. It's one reason why I love coming here. So, so Andrew, you called it a, a freedom dividend is, is what it was, right? A $1,000 yeah, for every single person 18 to 65? And it's actually now 18 until til, uh, you expire. Until you expire, okay. <laughs> also known as a uh, universal basic income program. Um, what is this crazy socialist policy that you speak of? Um, how does it work? And why do you think it's needed right now? Yeah. So the, the great thing is that if you look at our history, this is a deeply American idea. Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country, called it the Citizens' Dividend. Martin Luther King was for it in the 60s, called it Guaranteed Minimum Income, and he championed it in 1967, the year until he was killed the next year. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists had a study saying this would be tremendous for America. It was called the Negative Income Tax. 
And it passed the House of Representatives under Richard Nixon in 1971, twice. And then it became law in 11, uh, 11 years later in one state where now in that state everyone gets between one and $2,000 a year. In what state is that? Alaska. Alaska. And how do they pay for it? Oil. oil. And what is the oil of the 21st century? Marijuana. Technology. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I heard like marijuana, technology. I, I think you may know that guy out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're talking about the crazy idea. I mean, they're already doing it in Alaska and they love it. They call it the oil check. And we're going to call this the tech check. And then we're going to love it. So how do you pay for it? So uh, how much did Amazon pay in taxes last year? Zero. Zero. So I'm going to suggest that if you're a trillion dollar company and you pay zero in taxes, then something has gone wrong with us. It's not their accountant's fault. Their accountant is doing their jobs. It's our fault, our leader's fault, that we would let Amazon pay zero taxes. So what we do is we pass a value-added tax that then gets everyone here in this room a tiny slice of every Amazon sale, every Google search, every Facebook ad, every robot truck mile, and then we give it to you all. And yeah, some of that money will float up to Jeff and the gang again. You know, it's like, you know, buy an extra thing or two. But most of the money would stay right here in Iowa. It would grow your consumer economy by 15%. It would create 40,000 new jobs. And for the young people here, and most of you are young, it would give you a path to stay here if that's what you want to do. Because the tough part here in Iowa is that many people think they have to move to Des Moines or move to Chicago or leave the state in order to lead a good life. And it does not have to be that way. Especially when you got the Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, I attended a dinner um, at Coe College in Cedar Rapids with uh, the young Democrats there. And uh, another legislator that was with me actually brought, we are getting some feedback. Too much trouble. Too much trouble. Too much truth. Uh, Anytime there's a technical problem, I just say it's the Russians. It is. <laughs> I'm going to make a note already. to revisit that subject. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a legislator brought this up, and I don't think they were um, too steeped in the idea. But we ended up having a robust conversation. And uh, the professor that was there at the table with us, he was a history professor, um, and he, you know, he was supporting a universal basic income. And his point was, um, think about people's relationship to work. And this was mind-blowing to me, because I never thought about it in this way. Surely you have, but I'd like your, your feedback here. So he said, you know, look, you all want to grow up and you want to go into social services. Uh, historically, they don't earn a whole lot of money uh, in that field, in those fields or in those professions. But uh, a lot of folks here are going to go get jobs that offer certain benefits, and they're going to be tethered to that job. And in many cases, they're not going to feel free to pursue their dreams and pursue other jobs or start a business because they're tethered to the job because of the benefits. And so this professor offered um, the position that, you know, I support it because I think we're going to have more people doing things they actually want to do because yeah. they're going to have a little more support there to either buy benefits or hopefully we can yeah. have, we can have, have a, a country where we have universal health care. So, you know, for, for those people, and there are a lot of Democrats that aren't going to warm to this idea of a universal basic income, how do we talk about a larger uh, uh, perspective of what this actually could mean for individuals in this country? Well, I'm, I'm glad you raised it. Uh, I have to say, we have to get Democrats charged up about what $1,000 a month would actually mean in real life. The, the Democratic Party is supposed to be the party of female empowerment. There are millions of women around the country who are stuck in exploited or abusive jobs and relationships that would actually be improved by $1,000 a month. If they can have a you're walking into this situation. Yes. So what does the Democratic Party want to do? Does it want to talk about female empowerment? Does it want to put 1000 bucks a month into people's hands? Talk about elevating communities of color. You know what would help a lot with that? $1,000 a month. Because if you're, in a you know, if you're in an underprivileged community, you have less access, lower access to education and job opportunities. Your kids are having a harder time learning, and like putting this money into the family's hands would be a tremendous boost. LGBTQ, more likely to get kicked out of the house and fired from a job. You want to help with that? A thousand dollars a month. Like, the, like we have to start embracing the things we can actually do to make people's lives better. And this should be priority number one for the Democratic Party because we can actually accomplish a lot of the social goals we have in real life right now. 
you, you mentioned how the, uh, the program might benefit specific groups that have been historically discriminated against. Let's just talk about like how that, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, do you think there should be race specific measures to address economic inequality, health disparities, uh, disparities and inequality in our educational system? When you consider things like if you're a, uh, a black household or you're a black worker and you have a college degree, you're still likely to make less than someone who's white and has a high school diploma. Um, and on down the list, in healthcare, in education, uh, in home ownership, in wealth, um, there seems to be a very specific race-related disparity, uh, disconnect in our economy and the way our society works. And so some might argue that while a universe's basic income or a freedom dividend, as you call it, might be a great first step, there still is a lot, a lot more that we can do. And just to sort of close off this point, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, Andrew David Brooks, a New York Times columnist, conservative columnist, no liberal or progressive thinker, writer, he recently penned in the New York Times that he had been convinced that reparations was needed now because he has spent time, you know, touring the South and looking at, you know, uh, communities of color and spending time in communities of color. And he, he became convinced that now was the time that our federal government um, should do something about reparations. So what, what do you think about that? Um, I love it. Uh, I read Tyler Easy Coates and the moral case is 100% compelling. Yeah. Like this country was built on the backs of slaves. There are no two ways about it. And so if, if you say to me, hey, like, does the freedom dividend, is that uh, reparations? Of course not. Like the freedom dividend is something that can help put us in position to move forward. And I'm going to suggest that after we have this boot of scarcity off of our throats, then we can move towards addressing more of the fundamental inequities you're talking about. So this is a big first step, but I would certainly not say like, you know, that, that this, and the truth is that there's nothing we can, we can do to undo the legacy of slavery. You can't retrace history and generations. You can't retrace the, the blood of, you know, millions of African Americans over the years. So uh, I'm 100% on board with the moral case, and I would not ever claim that a freedom dividend that treats everyone the same is uh, accomplishing the goal of reparations. So let's, let's fast forward a year. You're elected president. Yay, yes. Yang Gang, Yang yes. Gang, shout out. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hashtag yes. Yang Gang. <laughs> You're elected president. Um, you pass universal, universal basic income. Everyone yes. gets $1,000. Yeah. Your next step to, to addressing some of these inequalities, inequalities is what? Well, so I, I have an agenda that uh, helps the African American community uh, more specifically. So one was we get rid of private prisons because it makes no sense to have prisons. Yeah. Yeah. Two, we legalize marijuana. Um, and then I'm going to mass pardon everyone who's in jail for a nonviolent yes. uh, yes. yes. drug offense. And I have a feeling we know just about everyone who's in jail for that stuff is going to be black. And I'm going to high five them all out of the way out of the jail. <laughs> and I'm going to do it on April 20th, 2021. Uh, third, we, third, we need to support. It's all, it's all real. Uh, I, mean, like, I don't know if you noticed, but Donald Trump's a president. Like, we can make this Anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I would support historically black uh, colleges and universities because they've done an incredible job over the generations, except right now our universities have become these big businesses. Mm -hmm. And so you have mm -hmm. these HBCUs that don't have the endowments, and so you need to, to probably support those and, and try and make sure that they can uh, be with us for our generations to come. So a lot of things we can do uh, relatively quickly, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say. Um, but, but, you know, like I said, I mean, this is going to be an ongoing generational uh, uh, process and there'll probably never be a point where we look up and be like, yeah, well, you know, like we made everything right. We did it. <laughs> like, like that's yeah. not, that's not the way it works. Like we're we just have to keep cool. trying to, <laughs> yeah. to, to work at it every day. Excellent. Andrew, um, what, can you talk to us a little bit? You've already talked a little bit about um, what you call female empowerment. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, where you stand on women's reproductive health? And, and I, I just heard you say something about universal health care, so that's great. Um, specifically, where do you stand on women's right to access abortion? You know, I, I think men should just leave the room and let women decide what to do. And I have a feeling I know what women would decide to do. 
Um, on the flip side, if men got pregnant, there'd be abortion everywhere. You know what I mean? It'd be like an abortion at every convenience store. Like, oh, like so. <laughs> like so, for, for men to decide women's reproductive rights to me just makes no sense. I would just be like, you handle it. I have a feeling I know what you're gonna do, and you know, it's it's. Now I, I will also say not to be make light of it. Like I'm a parent. I've got two young children, uh, six and three. One of whom is autistic, and. Uh, you know, every person who's pregnant, I mean, we should hopefully be in a position where we're celebrating like that baby's arrival and they come into a loving home and they have a, a beautiful life. And I'm going to suggest that one thing that might help that happen for more people is having a thousand dollars a month in every adult's <laughs> hands. Or if you get pregnant, you'd be like, oh, I can make this work. You know, <laughs> it's like, like that, that right, right now, uh, it, it's, uh, so again, I don't want to bring everything back to the fact that cash uh, will help certain situations, but for women's reproductive rights, it should be totally up to women in whatever you decide. I would get on board with and support them. I feel like your, your, your agenda, your, your platform is slowly winning over everyone here in the audience. Uh, I imagine that, that you get the, a similar response at other events. But what's your pathway to winning this nomination? It's a crowded field, it's an impressive field, it, it just got a little bit bigger tonight. Um, how do you get the Democratic nomination for the president? Holy cow, it's so fun. So I, I just uh, so I just officially qualified for the DNC debate. Uh, um, I'm polling at 1% according to Monmouth, and no one's ever heard of me. But, uh, the prediction markets have me at 7%. I'm like fifth. Uh, How does that work, though? The prediction markets. So the prediction markets is there are all of these uh, like internet types who then that like they, you know set up just like a bookmaking and being like, hey, who do you think is going to be uh, the Democratic nominee be the president, and right now I'm at seven percent, which is I'm going to suggest pretty high for a guy who no one has ever heard of. Um, uh, and so my my path, um, I mean my husband's nomination really goes to Iowa, and so my challenge here, uh, there are going to be about two hundred fifty thousand Iowans who caucus uh, in in twenty twenty. Now, like you said, crowded field. Let's call it fifteen to twenty candidates. So my challenge is I need to get approximately forty thousand Iowans who go to the caucuses on board with the fact that if we put a thousand dollars a month into your hands that this economy will function better now can i do that we're going to find out but i think i can do that and then after let's say i don't win iowa let's say i finish top three i'm still the story out of iowa everyone's still going to be like the anonymous asian man who wants to hear <laughs> uh, like just came out of iowa top three and then we go to new hampshire and you know what the third party of new hampshire is libertarians and you know what the libertarians love the Freedom Dinner. <laughs> it's named after them. And it's an open primary, a libertarian, you can vote in either one. So if I finish strongly here, I can finish strongly and even win New Hampshire. And then it's game on. Then everyone's going to be looking around and be like, how do we stop this? There's no stopping it. <laughs> so I've got a real path to victory. I'm raising $30,000 a day wow. in increments of 16, 17, 18, 19 dollars. So my fans are even cheaper than Bernie's. <laughs> but this wave is on and it's growing and if you all with your help we get 40,000 Iowans to show up in the caucuses next February we can take this all the way to the White House. Yeah. You, uh, you were recently on Fox News and you gave a pretty in-depth interview. Uh, I caught some clips of it before uh, uh, of this interview and I was getting text messages from a lot of my friends saying you got to check this out, you got to check this out. They were really surprised that a candidate for president uh, running to capture the Democratic nomination went on Fox News. Uh, tell me why you did that. Well, um, I've been on Fox News multiple times, uh, and the reason I went on is that they asked me to go on. <laughs> no, no, seriously. It's like, let's imagine you're Andrew Yang, you're running for president, and you're like, you know, trying to introduce yourself to Americans as fast as possible. And it's not like I had a choice between CNN, MSNBC, and Fox, and I was like, ooh, Fox. <laughs> that's not the way it went down. It was just like, Fox, and that's it. And so then I'm just like, all right, I'll go on Fox. <laughs> like, you want Fox? Now, and like the, to the bigger point, though, I mean, in order for us to win the big election, we do have to appeal to Americans who watch Fox. We have to appeal to Americans who, who might not agree with us on every front. Um, and so... You know, so the, the truth of it is, like, I went because they asked me, and I'm willing to go just about anywhere where people 
will want to have an honest conversation with me, and it will reach a lot of Americans. So, so you know, that was not a criticism, by the way. I thought it was. No, no, I didn't think uh, it was. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was pretty uh, courageous. And um, a follow-up I have to you is, you said something. You know, you're not. It's not like you have a choice. At CNN, MSNBC, <laughs> BBC, whoever else, they're not asking. Um, do you feel? Um, like there's certain candidates that are running who sort of have a corner on the market. Do you feel that the DNC even may be complicit even in uh, propping up other candidates? I mean, give us sort of some inside baseball. How, how does that sure. all work itself out? Sure. So I will say happily, the DNC seems completely transparent and fair this time. They were very burnt by the fact that everyone knows they stand back Bernie, and everyone's still pissed about it. Um, I was I, I supported Bernie. And so, not this time, though. <laughs> so, Clarification. Uh, so the DNC has been great. And we've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. It's like a different set of people. Like, they turned over that whole team. So being mad at them about what like, some people did like you know, the last cycle. Um, corporate media, I can't speak for them. Like, I will say that the like, corporate media does seem really into certain candidates and less, less into others. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm now getting invitations from C CNN and MSNBC because I made the Democratic debate threshold, and then everyone's like, hey, this guy's going to be on the debate, so we're going to look really dumb. And the fact that I can earn my way there with your help, I'm totally cool with. Like, you know, I mean, if they just want me to see what I can do, I mean, it's fine. They're going to see what we all can do in a minute, you know what I mean? Woo! Andrew, uh, you, uh, you corrected us back there when we said um, you were at a book signing you're just at a book signing but you have multiple books two books right yes. tell us your books what are the names of them right, why so should people read them you're not supposed to say this but the second book's a lot better than the first <laughs> 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 um so, so the first book i wrote is called smart people should build things it's about how we have too many um bright people heading to wall street and doing stuff that doesn't really move us forward and that what they should be doing yeah. is uh is starting generative businesses in places yeah. like uh, iowa city so yeah. that's what smart people should build things about and then the second book I wrote is called The War on Normal People, and it's about how we're automating away the most common jobs in our economy, and that AI is going to start replacing bookkeepers and accountants and lawyers and radiologists, and that we need to get our shit together as fast as possible if we're going to have a country that we're still proud of in next years. Sorry, kids. <laughs> <laughs> this is, there's normally not children here, but we're really happy you're here. <laughs> Um, so, so the second book, and here I'll give you a story that you know make my first whatever. So I was, so I was writing the second book, and I had an instinct that the second book was going to be like a you know a bigger deal than the first book was. So then I looked at my first book, and I was like, I'm going to take like the most important ideas in the first book and just like wedge them into one chapter in the second book. <laughs> that was what I did. So if you read War on Normal People, you got like the highlights of the first book like wedged into chapter nine. <laughs> so, so glad you're, you're undermining that. your first book's sales. I really am. I really am undermining my first book's sales. Let's go to book number two. It's not like my children. I don't have to love them both equally. <laughs> I, uh, I'm really glad you're on the show because it was really hard to get this crowd to laugh before you came up. So thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, another one of uh, another thing that one of my friends put me on was this Twitter hashtag called Yang Gang. Yes. Um, if you guys haven't checked it out, uh, you should. Uh, talk to us about this almost cult following you've cultivated uh, since you've been running for president. Hashtag Yang Gang. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the Yang Gang is a very recent development. <laughs> um, and and it, it arose, it seems it arose out of two media appearances. One I did in the Joe Rogan experience, uh, and then the other was at the Breakfast Club. Nice. And between those two things, there are a lot of people who are very strong in the internet, shall we say. <laughs> strong in the internet, I like it's that. It's a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they eventually, I think they got together somewhere and then so they said, hey, we're, we're going to um, create memes for the, the Yang campaign. And then all of a sudden, I was like, wow, <laughs> my face is on very interesting things. Uh, but, you know, so my wife and I were like looking at them and she was like laughing hysterically the whole thing. So, you know, I have to say, like, you know, I enjoy it, um, and uh, I'm I'm so grateful to to the Yang Gang. Uh, you know, it's it's just I mean to me, like it, it's really 
funny to see your name get out there in that particular way. Their, their meme game is really strong and creative, Very though. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're a creative bunch. I, I have to admit, I, I've been so, like, there have been at least a dozen times I've just wanted to tweet, secure the bag. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, you should you should totally do that. <laughs> yeah, I may do that. The Yang Gang will be there. But I, the just just to toot your your horn, Andrew, and, and, and um, I think it is connected to your message of the freedom dividend, and you've been able to appeal to this generation. I think of particularly white male, young white men, and males who've been disaffected uh, by the economy, um, who Donald Trump may have appealed to. And I think your message is starting to resonate that the economy is rigged or it's working against working people. Um, there's not a fair way to get ahead. Um, so to your credit, I think you've, you've tapped into something. Well, this economy is punitive, bordering on inhuman. Uh, and you can see it in the numbers. But like, how many of you knew that our life expectancy has declined for the last three years? Yes. Yeah. Like, who cares about GDP if you're literally dying of drug overdoses and suicides at yes. record levels? Uh, you know, so that, like we have to stop cheerleading these phantom economic stats and just like get real. Like mental health problems, record high. Suicides, record high. Uh, drug overdoses, all time highs. We have right now the same labor force participation rate as Ecuador and Costa Rica. No offense to those countries, but that's still not where you want to be. Um, you know, as an industrialized country, like more than just about all the others. So like one of the my my key pillars as president will be I'm going to update GDP just to mental health and health and like and like actually tell us how we're doing. Because you can't improve if you're looking at the wrong measurements. And GDP is gonna guide us off a cliff. AI is gonna be great for GDP. It's gonna be terrible for people here in Iowa. You know, like uh, you have some of these frankly exploitative schools like loading people up with student loan debt and the rest of it. Like believe it or not, that's actually good for GDP too because they like pay all these, these like yeah. vendors but that's terrible for people. I'm gonna forgive a lot of that student loan debt. That's yeah. what Oh, really? And, and, and I'm, I'm like passionate about this because during the bank bailout, they printed $4 trillion for the banks. Do you all remember voting on that? I don't. And they had a choice at that moment. They said, we have two choices. One, we're going to plow trillions of dollars to the banks. Or two, we're going to forgive the mortgages that people owe money on. And if they'd taken number two, the money would have gone to families, it would have kept their homes, the rest of it. But no, they chose the banks. So this time, we have the same choice. We have a $1.5 trillion in school loan debt that's weighing down young people. Are we going to choose our young people or are we going to choose the banks? I'm going to choose the young people. Yeah. So I, have a, I want to ask you a question about Game of Thrones. Yes. Yeah. Slash climate change. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> um, there was a recent UN report that said that we're, we've just entered another tipping point with respect to climate. I know, it's so depressing. Right, man. and it's every, every time you read it, and, and, the, and the commentator said it's like Game of Thrones, where um, the, the two factions are fighting against each other, but they're missing sort of the mortal existential threat, which are the White Walkers, right? Which is a perfect analogy, analogy for like climate change, you know? We're sort of caught in these silly, sometimes serious threats or, or de political debates, but when it comes to climate change, which poses an existential threat to our way of living and being, we're unable, unable to do something. So, first question. Do you watch Game of Thrones? Yes, very much so. Are you excited for the upcoming season? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, it's gonna be a lot to take in. I mean, uh, but um, you probably saw, like I said that, uh, that if I were president, I would give everyone HBO and one password. So <laughs> and I would say, in the interest of national unity, I would be so. And, and second question, a more serious question. Uh, you've come out on support of the Green New Deal, but I don't think the, it doesn't seem like the challenge is a, is a policy one, where we know what to do, whether it's the Green New Deal or something else, it's a political one. So how do we finally make progress on this issue? Yeah, so the last four years have been the four warmest years in recorded history. So you have to be out of your mind not to see that the earth is warming and that it's about to pick up steam. So uh, I think climate change is the existential threat 1A, and here's how we get better at fighting it. Because like you said, it's a political will thing. So right now in this country, 78% of Americans can't, are living paycheck to paycheck, and 57% can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. So you go to them and say, hey, we need to work on climate change. A lot of them will say, look, I can't pay my bills. The penguins can wait. Uh, that's, is that right? No. But if you have a mindset of scarcity, you have your head down, then it's very, very hard to get it up. So you make me president, 
I issue the freedom dividend, a thousand bucks a month, and then their heads come up. And then you come to them and say, hey, we need to worry about climate change. And look at their children and say, yeah, we do. And then we go very, very hard on the goals of the Green New Deal uh, and, and uh, you know, try and move towards renewables. But you can't do one without the other. You can't ask a population of people that, are like, that feel like they're inse their, their future is insecure all the time to focus on the big problems. I do want to save some time uh, for question and answers, but I'm just having a blast up this here. Right now. Um, so I've got a couple more questions for you. Um, you're running for president, man. Yeah, I know. Uh, and it, and it, uh, that's a mind-boggling thing to me. And I'm winning. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag secure the bag. Secure the bag. Um, so this question is just, what's it like? And it looks like you're having a lot of fun, by yeah, the way. Um, so talk to me about that. What's, what's this experience like running for president? I, the, the toughest part is being away from my family because I've, I've got two boys, six and three. Um, FaceTime helps, but like I, you know, I miss them a great deal. That's like the hardest thing about it. Other than that, it's a blast. What do you What do you enjoy the most about it? Uh, so a, a lot of it's just that first, my team is incredible. So imagine, if you will, people that left their jobs or law school or whatever and took giant pay cuts to come work for the Andrew Yang campaign when no one knew who I was. <laughs> you know, it's a special thing. It's a special thing. I mean, you they have to really. They're just exceptional human beings. So it's like working with them every day um, it is a joy. And then coming to, to Iowa and seeing that some people can really see the vision and see we can make this happen together. Um, the, the energy is, is incredible. It's a really, you know, humanity first, and like I feel like I'm becoming more human um, through this process from my robotic roots. <laughs> um, so it, it's just a lot of fun on, on that that side. If my family magically could like teleport around and hang out with me, you know, we, we'd be having a blast. I'm going to bring them to Iowa over the kids' spring break because uh, you know, because like right now they're in school, so you can't like you know just grab them every time. But then we, my, I said to my wife, I was like, hey, baby, baby it's like spring break. You want to come with me to, to Iowa? So they're going to... Oh, go to spring break for uh, Iowa. Husband yeah. Of, yeah. Husband of the year. <laughs> husband of the year. More like wife of the year, man. I love her so yeah. much. I owe her. You guys have to help me win for her. You You made a comment. You talked about your robotic roots. Talk to us about growing up. What was it like? <laughs> Um, so I, I grew up the only Asian kid in an all-white neighborhood in, in upstate New York. Um, and I'd skipped a grade two, so I was extra skinny. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, that, that was like a, like a tough um, uh, environment in some ways. So I always felt like this need to prove myself and like my masculinity was always in question. And, you know, I, I, I get like racial epithets all the time because, you know, I'm the only Asian kid. And so I get into fights and lose all the time. Uh, and, you know, and then, but it never occurred to me not to fight. It was like, all right, I guess it's time to fight again. And then, and then I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, that's... So I, I'm, I mean, like, like I'm, and the robotic passing is very much a joke because I was like, a deeply sensitive kid. I was very, you know, like bookish and, and read a lot, and read a lot, and had like these giant Coke bottle glasses because they hadn't invented thin glasses yet. Um, they hadn't invented a lot of stuff yet. So in first grade, they're like, hey, glasses. They're like, Coke bottles. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so that, that's a pretty much like the an Andrew Yang, you know, childhood story. I can give you a sense of it. Your uh, parents were highly educated. Yeah. Uh, father, yeah. professor. My, my, father, my father's now, a, well, he's just retired, but yeah, he was a professor. He was a, a physicist who generated 69 U.S. patents for GE and IBM. Wow. Mother uh, got a master's degree in chemistry. In uh, math and statistics. Math and statistics, and then became an artist? Yeah. Okay. Talk to us. Um, so I hear, I, you know, I've got a lot of friends who uh, have highly successful parents, and they grow up and they talk about, you know, there's this pressure to perform and... Uh, to live up to sort of their narrative, their expectations. And you, you've done pretty well. You've attended some pretty good schools for yourself. Just give us a sense of, um, you know, anybody else uh, living sort of uh, under the aspirations of, of others, or maybe that wasn't your, uh, your case. Well, Let's talk to us about that. No, I mean, I certainly have a lot of pressure to, to do well in school. But I, I want to say, too, it's like I'm up here now. I'm running for president. I seem successful and shiny and the rest of it. I remember being your age and still trying to figure it out. I went to law school, uh, which was maybe not the best choice, and practiced law for five miserable months. 
And then, and then I quit that job, and my parents were like really concerned because I still owed a hundred thousand in law school. That's one reason I get it. Like uh, you know, I remember. Um, and then my little company that I started completely flopped. Like you know, we went, we, I raised some money, and then we lost the money, and then like you know, the the dot com bubble burst. And my parents were still telling their friends I was a lawyer. You know, <laughs> and then. And then my friends were having birthday parties I couldn't afford to attend because like I was broke, like I, you know, moved in with my friends. So like there's like the shininess, but like I went through um, some like real confidence uh, testing times um, for a number of years. Uh, and it's one reason why I appreciate it. So like after my company was sold in 2009, I turned around and started a nonprofit to train young entrepreneurs because of that. Because I, I remembered what it was like to be a young entrepreneur trying to figure it out and it was so hard. And so I create an organization to try and create a support network for young entrepreneurs. And if you like documentaries, there's a, a movie on Netflix about my organization now. I make cameos. I'm an IMDB credit as myself. <laughs> um, uh, called Generation Startup to give you a sense of the work that I, I was doing. Um, but that's, you know, like, to me, that was like the high point of my career is creating that organization and creating thousands of jobs and being, uh, like I got to bring my wife to meet President Obama. Yeah, I was going to say, you caught the attention of the White House and uh, President Obama asked you to do some work uh, there after that. Do you talk about that experience? Yeah, so I was named a champion of change by the Obama White House, also known as the Good White House. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then uh, an ambassador of entrepreneurship. So, you know, I was, I was there with a bunch of celebrities and, uh, and, you know, and it was, I got to bring my wife. I was the only person who brought my spouse. It was so weird. It was like, you come, and there was like, this is my VP of da da da. This is my like comms person. I was like, this is my wife, man. Like, I don't know what the rest of you are doing. So, um, so, so spending time in the Obama White House. So like, you know, like that was the high point of my career. But then I, I got this after Donald Trump won the election in 2016. I realized that my work was like pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. And so like, you can't be like celebrated for like still pouring water. So you have to like re-examine things and say, okay, how do you plug the hole? And this hole I'm talking about is the fourth industrial revolution. It's like the greatest economic transformation in the history of the country. And for whatever reason, none of our politicians want to talk about it. Most of them, if you're generous, they just don't understand it. But I think it's darker than that, truly. Because when I talk to them, it's not just understanding, it's like willful blinders. It's like, you know, because we've been so brainwashed by the market and worshiping the almighty dollar that we have like these crazy fantasies about turning coal miners into software engineers. That makes zero sense. Like, like you know, what planet, like, would you even think that? You know what planet? Unfortunately, this planet. Because we're, <laughs> because we're so, like, in your, it's like, I have no value unless I have economic value. Right. You have right. lost your economic value, I must yeah. transform you into something that does have economic value. Yeah. It's perverse. And we can stop it. It's funny you, you said that. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar uh, with uh, recent news that there were quite a few celebrities who had paid up to several hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, oh, yeah, man, sometimes like, faking, you know, yeah. being a, a college or high school athlete <laughs> yeah, to so get bad. into. Um, so, so, how much did your parents pay? <laughs> 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 um, they, 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 I mean, they probably, no, they wouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> two more, two more. Well, well, well to your sort of, to go back to your history as an entrepreneur and working with startups, um, we live in Iowa City, we're in Iowa City right now at the Yacht Club, you spent some time in Cedar Rapids recently, I'm sure you'll go to Des Moines, or you've been, been to Des Moines? Des Moines? This is my ninth time in Iowa, you might not know it, but like, uh, I've been, I've been there, I've been there. <laughs> I didn't know that, but, um, you know, these are communities that have, uh, are doing a lot of work to build up the startup entrepreneurial scenes and, and, and communities here supporting entrepreneurs and basically creating the types of infrastructure and systems and ecosystems so that if you want to start a business or even uh, create a startup, you don't have to go to Silicon Valley or you don't feel like you have to go to New York yeah, yeah. Um, to be successful. Yeah. So what's your advice to communities like Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, and Des Moines who kind of want to build up that entrepreneurial community ecosystem here in the Midwest or in the heartland and not um, uh, and have, and, and I guess, and keep talent here. Here, yeah, 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 yeah. no. I'm friends with some of those entrepreneurs, and I have to say, I love the entrepreneurs of uh, Des Moines, Iowa City, and Cedar Rapids, like yeah, the, the people that I've met. Um, and the, the key from everything I've seen in these 18 cities that Venture Premier worked in is you have to have a few some companies that become successful and become role models for the others. And then if that company gets really successful and it starts throwing off um, VPs who leave and then start new companies. If it gets bought, then you have like a whole new suite of angel investors. And, and so what, what happens is there's a progression, but nothing works until a couple of companies uh, reach a certain point. 
and then you hope that those people then stick around the community. And I will say that will happen here in Iowa because there's a lot of love and loyalty uh, for the community here. <laughs> one right here next to me. Simeon. Yeah. No, Simeon is an entrepreneur. One day, one day. So. Simeon is yeah. a resident entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> so, you just got to blow up for the rest of us. Or just someone has to blow up, and then, like, you know, when they blow up, then you win. And I write their coattails. <laughs> yeah, no, really, that's a, you know, and, and in Iowa, like, people realize that, too. Like, I was talking to Ben Milley and Dwala and yeah. whatnot, and, like, everyone's just like, we just got to, like, whoever is winning, we just got to elevate that, <laughs> that, that outfit, uh, and then the, the rest of you win, too. Very nice. So, um, if it's okay with my co-host, I'll wrap with our questions, and then open it up to questions from the audience, and you, you're cool with that, right? Oh, yeah, very much so. So, uh, before we end, um, I, I asked our previous guest, um, when I meet interesting people, I want to know what they're reading, what they are watching, what they're listening to. So, where are you at on all those things? Um, I, I just uh, had, had uh, coffee with this professor, Jonathan Haidt, um, who wrote a book, Telling of the American Mind, and then he signed a copy and gave it to me, so, so that's the, the book that I'm reading right now. Um, and it, it's interesting. It's about how, you know, it's like how, it, it's in some ways it's about like polarization, in some ways it's about education. It's about like a few different topics. Okay. Uh, in terms of, uh, I'm just waiting for Game of Thrones to come out, man. Okay. I'm just like saving yeah. my viewing yeah. hours. Uh, um, you know what, movies, uh, you know, uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing right now that like, uh, I've, I've got like the queue of like the Oscar winners and like, you know, but I haven't had a chance to watch it. Another TV show that's out, I can't remember if it's on Amazon or HBO, but High Maintenance. If you haven't checked that out, it's a really, really good show. Oh, that's good. I heard good things. That's yeah. great, man. I'll take it out. HBO. That's what the crowd said. Is it HBO? Yeah. Okay. High Maintenance. Check it out. <laughs> what, are you, what are you listening to? What are you listening to? Uh, you know, I, I like the, my staff, my staff maintains the like iTunes or Jukebox. But if you leave it to me, I'll listen to a lot of 80s. I, I still like the 80s music. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's okay. karaoke happening after this podcast <laughs> here, by the way. So if we stick around long enough, maybe we can get you sure. some 80s jams. Yeah, I, I sing uh, uh, When Doves Cry by Prince. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely have to do that. Um, so we're going to do questions. We're going to do we're gonna some take a couple questions. Right questions. So Simeon's going to come around. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to get everybody. Um, but if you put your hand up, we'll try to take your question. Um, uh, please keep it to a question. Um, you know, it's okay to, I guess, say a little bit. But please don't use this as a soapbox. This is an opportunity for other people to learn about Andrew. Um, so uh, please pose a question. And we're only going to probably take three. Um, and sorry if you don't get picked. you got to come to the next show, I guess. So... Here we go, we have a question. Hello. Hi, my name is Stanzi. Um, admittedly, this is my second time hearing about you. First time was from my wonderful partner over here. So as somebody who is a second generation immigrant and relatively new to your platform, what are your thought potential policies around the immigration issue? Yes. So as you imagine, as a son of immigrants myself, I'm very pro-immigrant. Uh, I think that immigrants are being unfairly scapegoated for a lot of things in this country. Yeah. Uh, and so, so at the high end, like at, at a place like University of Iowa, if you have an international student who's getting a degree, um, we should staple a green card to their diploma because it makes no sense to educate them here and then say you have to leave. Right. Uh, yeah. Now, in terms of the over 12 million people who are here undocumented, there are three approaches. One, you can pretend you're going to deport them, but obviously you can't. It would devastate regional economies. You'd be separating families. The whole thing is a non-starter. Number two is you could do what we're doing now, which is nothing. Which has massive problems too, because you know, like uh, you don't know who everyone is. They show up at hospitals and get into car accidents and like uh, you know, in schools, and, and there are like huge issues with it. So number three, to me, is the best path forward is you create a long-term path to citizenship uh, for people here who are here undocumented that pay taxes and have a clean criminal record, and give them a real path uh, to uh, you know, uh, to long-term life and family here in this country. Awesome. Thank you for that. And by the way, what a great last name to have in the Iowa City community. No, it's my first name and it's the worst name to oh, have. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ricky Sanders. I know. Line. I'm sorry. Made yeah. of my existence in undergrad. I'm undergrad. sorry. Okay, Made all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> my name's Aaron. I'm a high school student at Iowa City West High. Woo-woo! I, I, I don't have a job yet, but I saw Bernie. I did have a job recently, but I saw Bernie Sanders a few days ago. I support you over Bernie Sanders, but I, Thank you. <laughs> I, 
I, I like him more in one way, unless you say yes to this. Because he, because he said he wants to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, and I want to know if in addition to the freedom dividend, which is awesome, you would also raise the minimum wage. Oh. So I, I am 100% for the spirit of a higher minimum wage, because no one should be working full time and be poor in this country. That's right. Uh, that's yeah. Yeah. I will say, though, that as someone who's run small business and private companies, there are businesses that if you were to increase the minimum wage to, let's say, $15, they would cut back shifts, uh, and they might even get rid of a worker or two. And that's certainly true in an industry like fast food, where if they pay, unfortunately, they pay way too little. They pay like 9 bucks or 10 bucks an hour. But then if you moved it to 15, they would automate away a significant number of those jobs. And it could be that that's cool. Like, you know, you don't have, like, you could make that decision. Um, but the reason why I'm so energized by the Freedom Dividend is that the Freedom Dividend is a $1,000 a month raise for everyone, and it does not come out of the small businesses. If anything, the small businesses are pumped because all of their customers all of a sudden have an extra $12,000 a, a month to spend. So after we pass the Freedom Dividend, if states wanted to implement a higher minimum wage, I, you know, I would be for that. I mean, it's for people who like to decide uh, what, what's going to work best for them. But I vastly prefer the Freedom Dividend because it infuses the... It comes the same thing, because everyone a raise. But not only does it give the people who are working with these small businesses a raise, it also gives the caregiver who the market ignores, it gives all the people that are doing work, it also gives them a raise. Um, so I'm 100% for the spirit of a, of a higher minimum wage, but I, I think that there are some other ways that I prefer to reach the same goals. I'm going to make the ask you a question. I'm a small business owner here in Iowa City and I have um, I have a lot of friends who are also small business owners and entrepreneurs and uh, an issue that we face is um, very costly health care. Oh, it's the we worst. Have to, we have to like buy individual so policies. Bad. We have to buy individual policies yes, as you I know. Hate that so much. A couple of years yeah. ago um, we, we were left with only one uh, one company to buy um, a policy from and it's very costly. Uh, now that there's no penalty for not uh, buying health insurance, how do you propose we fix this so that um, my friends and I can buy affordable health insurance? I feel for you so much because I've been in your shoes. And right now, our health uh, care system is the worst of all worlds. Not only are we spending twice as much on worse care by the numbers, but it also makes it harder to start a business, it makes it harder to hire. When you do hire someone, you want to, you're unfortunately, you're tempted to just make them into a gig worker contractor because you don't have to pay for their health care. Like, the whole thing is such a massive anchor on our economy. And so the way I would make this better is by moving towards a public option that gets the cost way down and the access way up so that you don't have to worry about it. And one of the things, I'll tell you personally, I've been a CEO, and I've been sitting there trying to figure out health insurance plans for my employees. And I was like, why do I, why do I have to become a health insurance expert in order to run a company? Like, this is the dumbest system ever. And it wasn't just the money I was spending on, health, on employees, because we had the money. But it was also, you have to have these conversations with your employees being like, here are your health care planning options. Like, and then different people have different preferences. And then you always, like, make, you know, make someone upset. And I was just like, I was like, this is giving me brain damage, and it has nothing to do with my business. I mean, obviously, I mean, it has nothing to do with but I took it incredibly seriously because I had an immense responsibility to my employees to try and find the best. Uh, so you can tell I'm passionate about this. I'm going to get this off of your back and off of all of your friends who are entrepreneurs' back so you can focus on growing your businesses, which is what you should be doing. Thank you. Thank you. But then, going to follow up question because some folks are calling for Medicare for all and some, some are calling Medicare for those who want it. What would you call what you're proposing and how would you pay for it? Yeah, so again, the, the biggest misconception is like, how do you pay for this stuff? We're spending so much money on our health care, it is yeah. insane. Yeah. We're spending 18% of GDP. Uh, and some of the, even the plans you saw, you were like, how am I paying this? Like, you're young, healthy, uh, you know, the rest of it. Like, we're just all paying up the wazoo. And after we get a hold of it, like, after you see what we can do with the public option, so my plan is just say, this Medicare for All, just said, it's like, look, it's public option, it's public health care, and everyone gets it, and uh, it's close to free. And the only thing is that when you make use of it, then you have a copay just so you don't like abuse it and show up like all the time for hypochondriac type stuff. But other than that, it's you know other than that, it's like essentially uh, going to be nearly cost free, and we can afford that. The reason we can afford that is because we're already spending so much money in the system. And then if you go to the companies and say, look, the money you're currently spending on healthcare, you're going like, to give it to us, and we're going to like bring the rates down, then you can get it done. Thank you.
I'm very passionate about that subject because it's, it's killing small businesses in particular. Uh, first off, thanks for coming to Iowa City. Very appreciative. Um, so I probably don't need to tell you, but the President of the United States is someone that plays a very significant role on the stage of world politics. And I don't want to name names, but our current president has done a lot of um, significant work in eroding the trust of the um, world community in the United States. So I just wanted to know um, your general thoughts on the role of the U.S. in global foreign policy and what you would do as president to sort of gain back that trust and what your thoughts on, what your thoughts are on just the United States on the world role. Yeah. So I think what's going on with our foreign policy reflects how we're doing at home. So we were falling apart at home. Americans were desperate enough to turn to our narcissist reality TV star as president. And now our allies regard us as erratic and unreliable. And so we have to make ourselves stronger at home, job one, so that then we can project actually sustained policies and values abroad. Uh, and I think we've gotten ourselves into entanglements uh, and messes that we should not have been in, and it's cost us thousands of lives, over a trillion dollars, tens of thousands of non-American lives. So I would have a policy of, of restraint and judgment and try and rebuild our relationships and, and alliances and partnerships as, as robustly as possible. I'm again kind of the opposite of Donald Trump, but it is related to what's going on at home. Is that if you're weak at home, then like trying to be strong abroad will not work. I also want to comment that I'm sort of a cult hero in a lot of Asia. <laughs> and so I think that there would be some celebrations in other parts of the world. And if you imagine a world where you get behind me and I become president, how much of the world would be like, holy cow, America really came through on this one. Oh, that is perfect. That is perfect. Hashtag Yang Gang. The Yang Gang is very large in other parts of the world. <laughs> Andrew, I want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your crazy schedule to join us here. Oh, such a blast. City, thank you all. Let's Oscar. give them a round of applause for bringing us together. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys. I think it's a perfect place uh, to end this podcast. Uh, please, folks, continue to check out our work. Follow us, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the things. If you feel so inclined, uh, offer a donation to us. This is a totally uh, volunteer-run operation. Um, all of our events to date have been free. Uh, so in order for us to keep doing really awesome programming, we really need uh, uh, people power. So we thank you for that. Um, make sure you tip your bartenders and your servers. And I was not kidding when I said there will be karaoke after this. So stick around. I don't know how much time Andrew has, but maybe you can catch a couple selfies with him. And if you're really, really nice and you buy him something to drink, maybe, what do you like to drink? Um, ginger ale. Ginger ale. <laughs> He's a responsible man running for president. Um, maybe we can convince him to do an 80s song. But seriously, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you. Thanks for thank coming out tonight, guys.